For 300 seconds, unlicensed battlefield guide Fran Fiak. I'm standing on a little round top this morning in front of the monument to the 140th New York Infantry Unit. This monument is a monument that I would describe as an on your way to monument. It's the monument you pass on your way to 44th New York, the castle behind us on a little round top. You'll notice that Colonel O'Rourke, the man depicted on the front in brass, always gets his nose rubbed, and that's why it's shinier than most. We don't recommend doing that, but obviously it's pretty hard to resist doing that. I'm here today to tell the story of this unit, the story of this unit that most people are not aware of. We're all aware of the gallant effort of the 20th Maine in its afternoon of July 2nd in their effort to hold the Union left flank. We're all aware of Colonel Chamberlain's ability to muster his men and to form an attack that will be a, a bayonet charge going down the hill to hold that side. But most people aren't aware that there was a second bayonet charge on this hill, and it was led by the 140th New York. Now, most people that rub his nose don't look above the monument. There you'll find the words duty, fraternity, valor, and patriotism. When we finish telling you the story of the 140th New York and their valiant bayonet charge, the second bayonet charge on July 2nd, 1863, I hope that when you visit Gettysburg or the next time that you walk by this monument on your way to another monument, you'll take a moment and talk about the soldiers that were here on this hill July 2nd from the 140th New York Infantry Unit. We've changed our camera position here a little bit, and if you look over my shoulder, way out in the distance, you'll see a monument of a soldier standing on a rock. That is our famous monument to Governor Kemble Warren, the general in charge here on the hill. The situation on the afternoon of July 2nd was giving him a lot of problems. Warren had come up onto this hill, and now he recognized the emergency. This hill, Little Round Top, was not covered on the afternoon of July 2nd. And to his horror, he looks out into the valley beyond, and he can see Confederate soldiers coming towards his position. He's already gone down once to bring up a brigade of Strong Vincent's men that contains the 20th Maine, the 83rd Pennsylvania, the 44th New York, and the 16th Michigan. But that doesn't seem to be enough to solve the problem as he looks out over the valley, and he discovers something very horrible coming towards him on his mountaintop. What General Warren sees as he looks out towards that cluster of rocks known as Devil's Den are more and more Confederate soldiers massing to come up the hill that he is now standing on. These are Texans and they're moving fast to take this hill. Warren has already done the best he can to save the nose of Little Round Top. He can hear the fighting over there starting to pick up and crescendo, but he knows he does not have enough men to cover this hill. As the afternoon sun of July 2nd is setting off to our west, the heat from the day is building, but not as much as the heat that's building on Little Round Top. Colonel Warren runs down, and there he finds the 140th New York, 526 men strong. They are led by 27-year-old West Point graduate, Patrick O'Rourke. Patrick O'Rourke from Ireland, an immigrant, graduates number one in the class of 1861 from West Point. His men are masked, and they're masked to go forward into the Peach Orchard area to help bolster the Union line that has been unduly extended by the actions of Third Corps General Daniel Sickles. They are in line in columns of four waiting for their orders. That's when General Warren arrives. Warren knows Patrick O'Rourke and he knows this unit and he says something to the effect of come quick there's an emergency on the hill. Now Patrick O'Rourke, this is his first military command, he has a decision to make trained at West Point, number one in the class. He doesn't have orders and shouldn't be taking orders from General Warren. Yet there must have been something in Warren's voice, a look in his eye, a tenseness in his tone that Patrick O'Rourke says, I'll follow you. General Warren says, I will take responsibility for it. So in his first command in combat, Patrick O'Rourke is essentially going to go against uh, command and control structures that he was taught in West Point. Now the men are lined in columns of four. You have to understand that soldiers in 1863 practice on fields of drill to go from columns of four into lines of battle. Everybody knows how to do that. But Patrick O'Rourke does not have time to turn his men around. Instead, it's believed he orders an about face. And you have to understand the confusion that's going to introduce into the 140th New York. First of all, the men in the front are now in the back. The man that was in the left front is now in the right rear. Not only are they backwards, front to back, they are left to right confused. 
O'Rourke doesn't have time. He moves to the end of the line, and he begins to race his men up the hill following General Warren. No sooner do they arrive on this hill, and to Patrick O'Rourke's surprise, Patty O'Rourke as he knows, the emergency has arrived. In front of him, in the fields in front of us and on the stones, the Texans are moving forward, and they're moving forward fast. Without time to allow his men to even load their weapons, he charges down this hill, and a second bayonet charge is held here on Little Round Top. But it's a bayonet charge without bayonets, and in fact, a bayonet charge without loaded rifles. The 140th New York will be successful in pushing the Confederate Texans off this field and holding this end, but it'll come at a cost. 27-year-old Patrick O'Rourke, who everybody rubs his nose, early in the assault, will receive a bullet wound to his neck and he will not survive. Supposedly, the monument is about this location where he received this, urging his men forward. There's also another story here, and that's the story of a 15-year-old 140th New York soldier named John Allen. John Allen is going to get almost the exact same wound here. Now, it brings into question how Allen was in the Army. First of all, he lied. He tried to get in the 108th New York. They realized he was a kid. Second of all, when he did get into the 140th New York, all he said was, I'd like to participate in one battle before you send me home. Now, I can't prove this, but if they're in a column of four and Patrick O'Rourke orders an about face, John Allen was probably in the back moving forward. But now in a twist of faith with the about face, John Allen's in the front. John Allen comes rolling over this hill, same time as Patrick O'Rourke, and John Allen is shot and his blood is on the rocks all around here at Little Round Top. John Allen is the youngest Civil War soldier buried in the Soldiers National Cemetery. But the next time you're up here, I want you to think about the words at the top. Duty, fraternity, valor, and patriotism. Those are very powerful words. Today's world and in 1863. Young men fighting and dying for their convictions, doing their duty as they understood it. For 300 seconds, I'm licensed battlefield guide, Fran Fiach. Thank you.